Welcome to yet another insightful and exciting episode of In Conversation. My name is Bongani Ngube, and today I'm going to be engaging with Professor Tankiso Mloy. Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. You see, um, I'm going to start from um, when I was preparing for this episode. I looked you up on Twitter and I saw that you're quite a space enthusiast and ultramarathoner. Those words stunned me at first. Yes, um, that's uh, interesting, isn't it? So you think of uh, ultramarathon running on the road, then you think of space. So in between our world, uh, what we call the blue marble and uh, the darkness, um, etc. So yes, indeed, I am, uh, you know, the space enthusiast. Um, whatever that's happening on space, it just tend to tick me. Um, yes. it, 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 it makes me happy. The advancement, um, the things that we've done on space, they, um, they make me happy. Then ultramarathon. Um, so as, as you know, so there is a marathon, there is an ultramarathon. So your 42.2 kilometers would be your standard marathon. Then anything beyond 42 becomes the ultramarathon. So, um, um, you know, ultramarathon in this case just simply means the comrades marathon. Um, for, for, um, I mean, for me, it's for the purposes of discipline. So when the body is tired, around 70 kilometers or so, then you feel like you can't move. Um, that voice, one saying, you're hurting, you're hurting, you're hurting. The other one says, 21 kilometers to go, 21 kilometers. So you're battling uh, between these two voices. And then the man that you'll see at the finishing line and the man that you'll be after the finishing line, you like that. Um, that's, that's the reason why I do, why I do ultra marathons. Wow. So that resilience for me and the battle that you have actually stuns me. Would you say it's the same resilience that has made you to attain so many um, accolades? You're a professor, you're a chair of four IR initiatives. Um, you, you hold a lot of positions in the academic space as well. Yeah, so everything so then um, is, uh, let's say, linked to hard work. Um, maybe so then uh, you, you, you call it resilience. So it's, it's hard work. And then um, again, so time and again, looking into the future. So then what would the future require? Hence uh, the FYR. And most people ask me, FYR in accounting, these things don't make sense, etc. So then I say, well, you have to look into the future. You have to project the future and then say, what does FYR mean? for our profession. So what does why I mean for, for, for accountants? So yes, um, hard work, uh, lifelong learning, um, et cetera, et cetera. So those, those are important things. Yes. And the future is certainly where we are going. Um, starting with accounting though, I'm also starstruck with accounting. So as a professor of accountancy at UJ, um, we know that it is one of the most sought after qualifications. What, do, what makes it the reason? What's the reasoning around that? Why is it important, accounting? So, so first and foremost, I was, um, I was looking at the statistics um, in, in South Africa, you have four accounting bodies, or oh, well, maybe five. Um, so then you have the South African Institute of uh, Chartered Accountants. It has 45,000 members, give or take. Then you have the South African Institute of uh, Professional Accountants. So it has about 15,000 members. Then you have uh, the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, so which is um, a UK accounting body, but operating in South Africa. Then it says it has about 6,000, 3,000 to 6,000 members. Uh, and then you have the Association of Certified Chartered Accountants. So we're not sure the number of members that, that it has. Then you have uh, the new body that uh, just came through. They, uh, it's referred to as the South African Institute of uh, Business Accountants. So you're looking at 6,000. So, but when you add, when you add all these numbers, uh, they give you less than 80,000 accountants. So um, you think about the population of almost 65 million, and then you think about the budget that will probably, uh, ex oh, well, it has exceeded two trillion. So then um, 80,000, uh, of course, you know, when you think about the budget, so you then think about macro accountants, which is economists in this case. So, but yeah, so then uh, together with, 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 with accountants, et cetera, et cetera, so 80,000 and with a population of 65, uh, 65 million people, give or take, then you would see that there is a shortage of, uh, of, 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 of accountants. Then that's what makes it uh, 
what people think it's a difficult subject, so whereas it isn't. And, and, and that, that literally takes me to the next question that I was having, because there's a general stereotype to say that accounting is more of a boring subject. Have you heard yeah, that before? I, I've heard that before. That's why when I was in the School of Accountants, in the Department of Accountants, so then we had uh, a saying that says, who says accounting, accountants are boring? W-A-A-S, who says accountants are boring? So yeah, of course, so I've had uh, that stereotype. Um, in my previous uh, employments, um, in, in, in national government, in mining and in banking. So they used to call accountants bin counters. So then you guys are just here to, to bin count. But when you think of accountants, um, so then they play an important role. So um, foresight and insight and then looking back. So then your financial accountants or your numbers that you see in the financial statements, tell, they tell you how you've performed. So then your management accountants, um, they would forecast, they will budget, they will tell you, you know, about the state in, 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 in the future. So they would use these numbers to gain insight and tell you about the, about the state of the organization in the future. So that's, uh, that, that's crucial in the life now of an organization, in the life of a corporate. And key word there has to be the future, which is, um, I feel like it's something that you have tried to marry, you being the chair of 4IR initiatives um, and accounting. I would, I would love to understand there that it has actually um, given you a close relationship with the former vice chancellor of UJ yep. um, and you guys co-wrote a book. Can you please tell us more about that? Yeah, so we've actually written a couple of books. We've written two books. One is uh, artificial intelligence and the change in nature of corporations. Um, so how artificial intelligence impacts the operations and, and the strategy making with, within an organization. And the second book is um, artificial intelligence in finance and economics theories. So we felt that it was important to do that book just so that uh, you know um, people that are studying economics and finance uh, would see how those theories are impacted by AI. So whereas on the other side, so we looked at the changing nature of corporations, how are corporations changing because of AI, because of the foresight, insight, massive data that AI can be able to accommodate and then prediction abilities, um, et cetera, et cetera, which again is important for management accountants. Um, you know, the ability to forecast and predict, and for management, for your boards, etc., cetera, et cetera, that becomes important. Um, if you can predict with a certain degree of certainty, then you are able to make the right decisions. So then it's, uh, it's in and around that. And there is a book that is coming by the end of, um, by the end of uh, this uh, next month, so which is April. So we, we're talking about enterprise risk management in the fourth industrial revolution. How does it look like? So that should have been his present as he moved to Japan. So then, um, so we, we're working on finalizing that. So that's definitely going to be an amazing belated birthday surprise for him. Yeah. Um, looking at because I was quite intrigued with the first book, which is called uh, The Artificial Intelligence and the Changing Nature of Corporations. For me, um, it actually gives, it stipulates and gives us those challenges of businesses uh, in a digital changing environment. Yes. And sticking on that digitally changing um, tr or transformation, transformating society, um, what makes a good leader in such a space? So if the society is transforming, what makes a good leader? Actually, so then that's a, that's a good question. So I've, I've been reading a lot in and around the space. I'm thinking, how does a leader look like in the fourth industrial or fifth industrial revolution, or you call it uh, the period of um, intelligence, so, or machine intelligence, how, how does a leader look like? So then I came across the book, um, I think it's uh, Linda Hill et al. So they looked at the uh, um, companies that were successful and then they went to kind of uh, do the observations on, on these companies. They, they kind of look at how the projects were discussed and who was playing a major role, etc., etc. So they were so surprised. The leader, what, you, what, what we would call a leader, would take his cues from the followers. So the leader becomes the follower. So then the followers would formulate and tell the leader how the thing is going to work. 
the job of a leader is to support. Um, so then I was, I, was, I was quite intrigued. I think they looked at about eight or nine companies, startups and big um, IT uh, businesses. So then across, across the globe, um, looking at leadership. So um, I would say in, in, in the 21st century, that, that actually intrigues me as well to, to understand that I wanted to understand the role of a leader. You know, a leader we're expecting to lead a group of people. And yeah. in your case, as you were also intrigued, to understand that the leader is now taking cues from the followers. Yeah. That relationship for me is quite, is quite beautiful to watch. So in that given, do you think people and leaders are actually taking opportunities that are afforded or offered by 4IR? So some companies actually have, some leaders um, have taken, taken opportunities. Some, of course, so then because of the uncertainty, so in and around the technologies that are surrounding the 4IR, then they've taken the back step. And in, in some environments where um, the labor union, uh, you know, is, is, uh, you know plays, uh, plays an important role, so they, they've taken a back seat of some sort just to try and understand what the beast is, uh, is, is all about. So then, but if you look at uh, um, countries that uh, are, are successful today, um, smaller countries like your Lithuania, so they've taken advantage of, uh, you know, uh, the technologies, uh, the today's technologies. So if you look at China, so China and, uh, and the US are basically the two countries that are slugging it out when it comes to artificial intelligence. They're investing heavily so that they're, they're taking advantage of, um, of, uh, of, of, um, of artificial intelligence and related technologies, uh, technologies of, uh, of the 4IR. So I was just looking, for instance, um, last year around this time, so the UK um, released uh, its 4IR strategy or its AI strategy also. And um, the way they had looked at it was that they did not want their military to be left behind. So then, as uh, you know, countries take advantage of, uh, of the AI space. But right now, there are two leaders, uh, China and, um, and, and, and the United States. So then to your question, so I think some companies, some countries have taken advantage and, um, you know, um, used the AI technologies, used 4IR technologies to propel their economies, uh, to propel their militaries uh, forward. And, and some countries have probably, maybe because of uh, investment that needs to be made in the space, they've taken a, a little bit of a backseat. Yes. So having said that, with the use of 4IR, right, coming into play and um, the, the effects that 4IR impacted in society, would you say there is a slight recovery from that based on the uses of 4IR? Yeah, so then uh, I would say there is, uh, the, the, the is um, a, a slight recovery, so I would assume that you mean recovery economic-wise? Yes, economic-wise, yes. business-wise. So yes, there the is, uh, the, the is recovery. In actual fact, so then if you think about it, I, I think about this all the time. So you think about uh, a restaurant, right? And during COVID, the lockdown, what do you think happened to the restaurant? So some of them, they stopped cooking and because people have to come sit down and eat. But, you know, some invention says, OK, no, you can have Uber Eats. Oh, now we can go. The few of us cook, then dish, then, you know, then through an app order food. So then there's continuation of, 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 of business. So I remember so then when, when COVID started, then we started saying, how do we use Blackboard? How do we teach? How do we... But I mean, so then your MS Teams, um, your whiteboard on MS Teams, your Zoom, your Cisco WebEx type of technologies allowed us to have business continuity, to proceed with the, with, 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 with the teaching and learning. So, um, you know, the, 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 well, let, let's say there was a little bit of, a, um, you know, stop then, but, you know, afterwards there was a continuity in, uh, in, in, in business. And I just believe that uh, having seen the benefits of what the uh, AI technologies can do, so most businesses will begin to take advantage of, uh, of, of the technologies.
And that's absolutely true. And even I myself, as part of the institution, I think we saw how Blackboard collaborates and how classes yes. are carrying on. Even filmmakers yes. learned how to do films through that space. Yes. And we're still, now we're marrying the two, you know, people get to come on campus and they still do study online as well. Yes. So that for me actually grows business in it, in a sense, if we're speaking in business, we have those two that are progressing now. Um, yes together. So moving along, would say now, on a, on a broader perspective, um, how can we use technology to improve the issues of governance and compliance in public sector? Yum. So when you, when you talk about governance and compliance in the public sector, I, I think about the role of the Auditor General. So then the Auditor General is supposed to be doing audits. So then in, in municipalities and public entities and government departments, provincial and national, etc., etc. And you can understand the volume of work that needs to be done there. But be, be beyond the volume of work, so I've learned that in some cases, the auditors would go to um, the offices. Uh, I think the story was carried in one of the newspapers in Bumalang, and they were threatened. So then what's the role of um, technology in, uh, in, in, in a space like the public sector? So now you can do let's say the remote audit so you don't have to expose lives uh, of people so then in in such a you know harmful environment so you can do uh, the you know the remote audits of course there will be shortcomings um, in, in, in in such an audit but as you train the machines as you train uh, train test them train test them etc et which, which is what we do with machine learning so you'd get to a point where you know the machines are able to identify some of the things in the public sector and, and then conduct uh, that, that particular audit. And then just generally, so if you think about uh, the public sector having work there, so then the process is just too analog, the process is too manual. So still a lot of forms. I, I remember the other day I was asking, is the Z83 still a manual form or now we have to capture online? Can't remember what the answer was. But the process is, is still manual. So in, in manual processes, you open up the space. So you open up the space for, for the opportunity to do, um, um, so then what would be the word? Um, things that will lead to irregular expenditure um, so, and, and then fruitless and wasteful expenditure. So technology does have a role to play in the public sector, but as well as, uh, again, so in, in the private sector. So I'm looking at this from your audit perspective uh, specifically, so which you would deem it governance in, in your question. And no governance problem. refers to the manner in which uh, institutions are directed and, and, and run. So then as you run the processes, so then in and between and you use technology, so then uh, in, in your processes you, you eliminate that chance that I spoke about. Wow. Well, the word that has been buzzing in my head has been auditing, as you've also been saying that your answer was centralized around that. Um, I would want to know, to, um, I believe audits are also, accountants also conduct our audits as well. So yes. what would be your message to aspiring accountants um, entering the space which has been transformed by 4IR? Yeah. So most accounting bodies that I've mentioned have already started to introduce uh, 4IR technologies. So one of the technologies that we use a lot, by the way, in auditing is called robotic process automation. So where we automate the processes, then you don't have, as an auditor, have to go to each process, try to figure out what happens. So we use robotic process automation. So and other technologies, um, so I think, for instance, in taxation, they're starting to use the natural language processing. So then to, to process some of uh, you know, the text, uh, text, text information that would be textual yes. in, 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 in nature. So what I would say to future accountants is, is that uh, the qualification that we, we, we provide you, so would have some elements of the 4IR technologies, but will contain the core elements of, of, uh, of, of accounting, which is your financial management, so then your financial reporting, your taxation, as, as well as your auditing, but it now contains some, it begins to contain some things like data science, how to use data science in, um, in, 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 in auditing, in accounting, how to use the R, how to use Python. So um, how, do you, how do you do EDA? Um, you know, how do you EDA on Python? So if, if you are an accountant, to begin to look for you know, trends, et cetera, et cetera. So we're beginning to introduce that in, 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 in accounting. So, and accounting bodies are also beginning to introduce that 
um, as part uh, of um, the CPD's continued uh, development practices. Well, you couldn't have said it better, Professor. Um, to now to the UJ viewers at large, what would you, what would be your message to them, uh, given the conditions that we and it's a new dawn for the institution, of course, continuing with where the visions of the previous leaders were. What is your message to them? Look, I think they must just look forward for uh, what the Vice Chancellor was talking about. I'm also looking forward to that the digital twin UJ having its twin. Uh, digitally so I think that will open a lot of uh, opportunities and then they must be also be on the lookout for more projects that uh, have been announced thank you so much professor for it's my pleasure coming through well there you've had it viewers we say here one conversation at a time and we are always pleased to learn and be educated by our guests with that being said see you on the next show the University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.